Oops, before we get to uh, diffraction polarization, we still have another video about interference in chapter 37. Uh, diffraction polarization is in chapter 38. Interference phenomena, we can't forget about thin films. In a thin film, you can have phase changes due to reflections. An electromagnetic wave undergoes a phase change of 180 degrees, or pi, radians, upon reflection from a medium of higher index of refraction than the one it came from. For instance, on here, we have a uh, light ray coming in from, say, air, incident on some kind of material, maybe glass, and as it reflects, it will undergo a 180 degree or pi phase change. Kind of like if you had a string um, to a rigid support and you have an incident wave encountering that support, as it encounters the support by Newton's third law for every action, action there's an equal and opposite reaction. As the string is pulling one way, the support pulls exactly opposite. And so whatever wave comes in is going to be pulled exactly opposite whatever it was doing when it came in, and it's going to come out reflected exactly 180 degrees reversed. Of course, there's no phase due to reflection if you go from a, at a boundary from a medium of higher index of refraction to one of lower index of refraction. So say if we had light coming from the glass headed towards the air, if it were to reflect off that interface, there would be no phase change for that reflection. And the mechanical analogy to that is if we had a wave uh, pulse on a string but our support was free, it was free to move. So whatever the wave did when it came in, it was free to move. There was no um, reverse action of the support or Newton's third law on the support. It just did what it, it did. And then when it comes back out, it's going to look exactly the same. So no phase change for that type of reflection. So this gets us to interference in thin films. They're commonly observed in thin films. Examples are soap bubbles, oil on water, oxidation layers in antique glass, and metal oxide layers on ceramic glazes. Interference is observed due to the interaction of the waves reflected from both surfaces of the thin film. So we need some things to happen in order to see interference on a film. An electromagnetic wave traveling from a medium of index N1 to a medium of index N2 undergoes a 180 degree phase change or pi radian phase change on reflection if the second index N2 is greater than the first index N1. So if you're going from lower to higher, you will get a phase change. No phase change if you're going from higher to lower. If your first index is higher than your second index, no phase change upon that reflection. The wavelength of light, lambda sub n, in a medium where an index of refraction n is the wavelength out of that medium in a vacuum divided by the index of refraction of that medium, lambda divided by n. So we have to keep that in mind. If, if the light goes into a medium, the wavelength is going to be shortened by the index of refraction of that medium. And one of the reflected waves travels a greater distance than the other reflected wave. So we're going to have a path difference between the two interfering waves. So we have a phase changes upon possible reflections. We have a difference in wavelength if, it's, if one wave is passing through a substance. And we have a path difference if we're interfering waves off of two different boundaries. Here's an example. We have ray one coming in here and we have a reflection off this first surface A and there'll be a 180 degree phase change on that first reflection. Then uh, the refracted ray goes through the substance and as it's going through the substance, 
its uh, wavelength will be shorter by the index of refraction of that substance. It will uh, internally reflect off the second surface B. In this case, we're going from a higher index to a lower index, so there'll be no phase change upon that reflection, and it starts to come back. It travels an additional distance, though, equal to twice the thickness of the film. It goes there and back again, and with that shorter wavelength, so we have to calculate that into our phase change because there could be a phase change due to what, what difference in cycles we have as the waves pass that extra, dip, uh, extra path difference. All these we will consider into our thin film interference. So in this particular case, let's say we had a thin film when light passes through a film of soap, which is exactly three quarters of the wavelength of green light, we will get constructive interference for green light and not, nece not necessarily any kind of um, real constructive interference for any other color light because the green light will pass an extra one and a half wavelengths of path difference and upon reflection we'll get a half uh, wavelength from that so we'll get an exact constructive interference of multiple wavelengths when it comes back out. That means we're going to see a nice green reflection from that thickness of film. Here's a soap bubble of varying slight thickness. And where the thickness is just right, three quarters of the wavelength of green light, then you will see green. But if it's three quarters of, of the wavelength of violet light, we'll see violet. And so that's why we see all sorts of colors because the thickness of this thin uh, bubble film is varying itself as the light is interfering with it. Here's um, some oil on some pavement and we can see different colors there due to the varying thickness of the oil on the pavement itself. Not sure what this is, but we can see the different colors of the interference in this pattern. As we do um, the, the interference, the light you actually see off of um, a hummingbird is not necessarily the color of the hummingbird itself, but the interference of light due to the uh, reflections on the hummingbird that gives you a specific color coming back towards you. If he wears a sweater, you won't be able to see this, but most of the time, hummingbirds don't, don't wear sweaters. All right, so <clears throat> path difference is important. To get constructive interference, since we already have one phase reversal um, for a thin film, we want the rest of the phase difference to be due to the path and we want that to be a half wavelength difference so we can get constructive interference when we come out. So we want twice the thickness of the film, 2T, to be equal to an integral number of half wavelengths of the wavelength of the light within the film, within the medium. That's going to be lambda sub n. So that's going to be an integral number of half wavelengths. Lambda divided by n is our wavelength within the medium. So this translates to 2 times the index of refraction of the medium times the thickness is equal to an integral number m plus 1 half times the wavelength of light in a vacuum. That will give us constructive interference. This takes into account everything. The difference in optical path length, the 180 degree pi phase change for a thin uh, bubble film, which is uh, surrounded by air on both sides and the shorter wavelength occurring within the bubble film itself. For destructive interference, same ideas, only we, we want the total path difference to be uh, exactly an integral number of wavelengths and let the one phase change, phase um, reversal, do our destructive interference for us. So we want 2 times the index times the thickness to be integral number 
of wavelengths that gives us destructive interference for the soap bubble. So this, this is a, a look at what the soap bubble might do, where we have uh, one reflection, 180 degree phase change, the other reflection, no phase change. So going through a media surrounded by air on both sides, we would have one phase reversal and our formulas apply. But it's possible we could have a thin film on top of another substance. And so if we were going from air, say a lower index, to a thin film of silicon oxide, and then we go even to a higher index substance after that of silicon, then we would have a phase reversal every time we're going from a lower index to a higher index. So in this case, we'll have a phase reversal on our first reflection and a phase reversal on the second one as well. That's going to reverse our formulas for constructive and destructive interference. Because in this case, we want the path length for constructive interference to be the integral number of half wavelengths and for destructive interference to be, um, I'm sorry, uh, we want constructive interference to be an integral number of wavelengths and destructive interference to be an integral number of half wavelengths. So for interference with thin films, the equation to use for one phase reversal is 2nt equal integral number of half wavelengths for constructive interference, destructive for zero or two phase reversals, and then just reverse that, 2nt equals m lambda for destructive interference for one phase reversal and constructive interference for two phase reversals. Another way we can get interference from an idea of a thin film, in this case a thin film of air, if you will, is Newton's rings. We put a plano convex lens on top of a flat glass and we let the air um, gap in between the two act as our thin film. So in this case, if I have a ray of light coming in like this, um, part of it will refract here and that will go through air, give me a phase reversal when it reflects off the flat glass here coming back, whereas this ray number two here is not going to have a reversal at all as it goes from a higher index glass uh, towards air here. So we're going to end up with two rays coming back with one phase reversal and hence the path difference will have to be a half wavelength to get constructive interference and uh, integral number of wavelengths to get destructive interference. So constructive interference would correspond to 2t m plus 1 half lambda. Note that there's no index of refraction in this equation because the index, the, the film, if you will, is air and the index of refraction of air is 1. So we have a thin film of air. It might look something like this. So we have this plano convex lens on top of a flat glass and we see this interference pattern. Um, the length between fringes is just showing us how it doesn't change much in its thickness as we're, we're towards the curved part of the lens resting on the glass. But as we get further and further out and the, and the thickness is changing more rapidly, then the fringes are closer together. Actually, this kind of pattern can tell you how good your lens is because if you had a perfectly grounded lens, then you should have a perfect symmetrical pattern on this uh, Newton's rings pattern. And if it's not symmetrical, then you want to go in there and shave off the lens so that you can create this pattern that's perfect and then you know that you've created uh, or you've um, um, worked your lens to the point where it is, it is perfect. I want you to study this and take a look at this pattern really closely for this reasons. Study it very, very closely 
and tell me what you see. Keep on looking at it. Keep on looking at this pattern. You will study your physics. You will study your physics. I'm going to use any kind of teaching method I possibly can. Okay, CDs and DVDs. Data in CDs and DVDs are stored digitally. digitally. <laughs> a series of ones and zeros read by a laser light is reflected from the disk. And that will give us uh, either constructive interference or destructive interference, depending on how they hit the disk. And that will give us a one or a zero or a binary code. Strong, strong reflections correspond to constructive interference. These represent zeros. Weak reflections correspond to destructive interference. These reflections represent ones, giving us our binary code. Here's how it might look. We have a laser light coming in. Some of it hits the pit here. And if we're on the edge here, some of the light will hit the top of this um, protrusion here, and that interference, the difference in path length between the two, if that pit depth is equal to one half of the wavelength, there will be a path difference of one half wavelength, and hence we'll have destructive interference corresponding to a, a one on our uh, binary code. So every time you hit a, um, a interface here of the pit, you will get a one, and any time you're timing and you get nothing, you're either flat on top or flat in, inside the pit, you will get a zero. So as you're timing this, zero, zero, hit the, uh, hit the edge, a one, edge, one, zero, edge, one, and so forth, as you go across the flat planes. And that gives you a code for recording all this digital data. So all the bump edges are recorded as ones. All the flat planes are zeros. Same thing for DVDs. Difference for DVDs is they use shorter wavelength lasers, and hence your, your track can be smaller as well. So your track separation, your pit depth, your minimum pit depth and length are all smaller for DVDs. That allows you to hold more information on the same size disk. DVDs can store about 30 times more information than a compact disc or CD. You can also have dual layer or single layer. A dual layer has a transmissive uh, layer. It allows you to get double data off the same surface of the DVD. Uh, so it allows you to get data from one layer down below and then you have uh, reflections off the second layer, giving you more data to collect and to be able to store on the dual layer disk. You can go one better. You have Blue Jay technology. In Blue Jay technology, you shine a laser off a Blue Jay, and the interference phenomena of the wings of the Blue Jay help uh, give you your your pits, your constructive and destructive. Wait, it's not not blue jay technology. It's uh, blue ray technology. Blue ray technology uses a different uh, frequency um, laser. Blue ray technology allows you to store even more information, get higher resolution, and um, store more information on onto the disk. That concludes our second short lecture on interference phenomena. Try your hand at some of the problems in the problems.